Since 1934, Iowa's farmers have turned to the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman as their trusted news source. Now, the spokesman speaks. Listen in and hear from leading experts on topics important to farmers and agriculture. Now, here's your host. Welcome to our March 21st edition of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and in honor of National Agriculture Week, which runs from March 20th through the 26th, today's episode is packed with insights into one of the most talked about topics for farmers these days. Of course, I'm talking about marketing meat directly to consumers. First, we'll introduce you to Janice Hostetler, who's a food safety and labeling coordinator for the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship's Meat and Poultry Inspection Bureau. Janice is going to talk about the first steps livestock farmers should take if they're interested in marketing directly to consumers. Then we'll bring on two entrepreneurs who have launched their own successful direct-to-consumer ventures, Ray Schmidt, who's the founder of Farm Story Meats in Story County, and Lily Beringer of Beringer Family Farms Beef in Jones County. Let's get things started with Janice Hostetler, a food safety and labeling coordinator for IDALS. Spokesman reporter Corey Munson has the story. Starting out, can you tell us a little bit about your roles at IDALS and how your work impacts livestock producers here in Iowa? I work for the Iowa Department of Agriculture's Meat and Poultry Inspection Bureau. We are one of 27 states that have state meat inspection programs that hold cooperative agreements with our USDA partners. We inspect small and very small locker plants that you'd find in any small town here in Iowa. Most of those plants either do custom exempt slaughter and processing where the livestock owner takes it in, the locker provides a service, and the livestock producer takes it home for their own personal use. We have other plants that also slaughter and process livestock so that those products can be resold at farmer's markets, retail outlets, restaurants, and the like. My specific job with our bureau encompasses food safety and labeling. Food safety is just ensuring that the plants have the programs in place to um, ensure products are sanitarily dressed. Sanitation is a big key component of that, along with cooking, cooling, keeping things chilled, just the things that you would do at home as well to keep products safe. The other part of my job deals with labeling and processing information, their standards of identity, products, a sausage has a standard, as well as specific components have to be on that label. And we make sure that the consumer can tell by the label what they're buying, how much it weighs, how to handle it, what ingredients are there. And I also answer a lot of constituent phone calls that includes everybody from the legislature on town to the neighboring farmer um, that just wants to know what I need to do to um, sell my products. Now, one of the things in Iowa is we have both state inspected as well as USDA inspected plants. And I know your interest is specifically on the state level. Can you kind of describe briefly what the difference between those two options are for a local locker? Yes. State inspection, as I mentioned, there are 27 states that have it. We hold cooperative agreements with USDA. We actually follow the same rules and regulations. We have to be equal to the USDA program. The only prohibition that we have is that state inspected product cannot be sold into interstate commerce, meaning it cannot be sold across state lines. Those rules were written over 50 years ago and for whatever reasons they had at the time to have that prohibition. However, in the past two years for the state of Iowa, but in 2008 with the Farm Bill and then on to 2012, around those lines, USDA created a new program for state meat inspection programs called Cooperative Interstate Shipment. And states can voluntarily elect to have that program that allows state meat inspection plants to sell product across state lines, but there are a few additional requirements than just state inspection that they have to meet. Currently, Iowa has been under that program for two years. We have a total of nine processing 
and slaughter plants that are under that of our approximately 76 um, state meat inspected plants that could uh, do that program. Uh, do you find there's a lot of misunderstanding about IDOL's role in food safety and how that impacts consumers as well as processors? Yes and no. Um, I think what the misunderstanding is between difference between USDA inspection and state inspection that we are equal to. We adopt the same rules as USDA. It's just how we do it may be a little different because we are working with very small locker plants that you find on Main Street in any town in Iowa versus a very large corporation such as, you know, JBS and some Tyson and those. The misconception is that we're lesser than USDA inspection, and that is not the case. And that's one of the messages we'd like to get out to everyone to understand that we do the same things. There's nothing lesser than the products coming from a state plant are just as safe as they would be coming from a federal plant. What are common questions that you get uh, phone calls from either consumers or uh, livestock producers in the state? What, what are you hearing from folks right now? Well, right now there are kind of two areas that we get. One is the livestock producer that wants to sell product that they um, out of livestock that they produce, steaks, roast, further value-added products such as sticks or summer sausage, bratwurst, those types of things, ham, bacon. Or you have the other group of people that would like to start their own plant. Those that are livestock producers that want to sell product is just – how do I do it? How do I do it correctly? What rules and regulations? Who, knew, who do I need to contact? And right now it's farmer's market season starting up. Everybody's gearing up for it. So I've actually got a couple um, other uh, invitations to speak at some groups to help them understand that they, they've seen a, a definite increase in those wanting to sell meat and poultry products. Um, the other group that we hear from are people that want to start their own plant. And that is a huge undertaking. It could take up to a year to build a plant, let alone the planning that goes into it and their, the rules and regulations that are out there. But they just want to know, what do I have to do? And so they can go back and do their homework to put a good business plan together to possibly build a plant. Now, speaking about producers specifically, what are some of the steps involved if they do want to start selling those products? Like you say, at a farmer's market or you know, to folks around town, something like that. Great question, Corey. There's two avenues for livestock producers to sell their products. One is to sell the live animal to a new owner and have it done under the custom exemption that allows that product to be produced at a locker plant and goes directly back to that new owner for their own personal use. It's not resold. Either you can buy a whole beef, half a beef, a quarter of beef, um, and they get everything back. That is the traditional method that most livestock producers are probably most um, familiar with. Um, but right now they're, they're trying to step up their game and get out, like you said, to farmers markets or direct marketing as we talk to consumers. And that takes a little bit extra because that's when you need to get a relationship with a what we call an officially inspected plant that we as inspection inspectors provide anamortem and postmortem inspection as well as processing inspection throughout the process to ensure to that consumer that those products were made under um, wholesome conditions of that vet. So first thing is finding that plant that will work with you. The other things that go along with that is if a label, you need to talk to that plant about label labeling, what cuts and what kind of products you want to make, and scheduling. When can you get it scheduled, turnaround times along those lines. So making that first initial thing is that relationship with that locker plant and what services they provide and scheduling. The second part that they need to know about is if you are going to store product or sell product, you will need to get in touch with our partners at the Iowa Department of Inspections and Appeals and Food and Consumer Safety Bureau for short, the food inspectors, because they are the ones that will license a warehouse, if you will, wherever you store your product on your property or on your premise, as well as if you have farmer markets you want to go to, you'll need to be licensed by them as well. But they are, if they call me, I can get you in touch with them to get their contact information because it may be a local person. It may be somebody out of their state office here in Des Moines. So those are the two main things is that relationship with the locker plant and understanding what services they're able to provide to them from cuts to labeling, et cetera. 
to um, how you're going to sell it now uh, licensing by our partners at food inspection whether it's warehouse or farmers markets what resources are available to help farmers who may be interested in this process? Uh, can they go online to the state's website and see information there, or how do they do that? The best thing I would suggest that they do is to give me a call, because I like to ask them exactly what they're going to do, because fortunate or unfortunately, there's always different facets to this process, and I kind of vet out exactly what they're trying to do so that I can tailor the information that I would get to them. I do send out an email to them that has like the contact information for food inspection and others out there that I know of, um, websites and such like that. A couple are um, CIRIS, the Center for Industrial Research and Service with Iowa State University has um, some resources as well as there's a group out of Oregon State University that I use the Niche Meat Processors Assistance Network. They cover the whole entire country, uh, have a listserv and a lot of resources there that they send them to. Our website is still in development with some of these direct marketing pieces to put on our website. There are a few there currently, but the best thing is just give me a call. I'm willing to talk to any of them and turn around and send an email out with those resources. That's a good overview from Janice, and you've got to appreciate her offering to answer your situation-specific questions as well. So if you'd like to run your questions by Janice, her phone number is 515-281-8858, and we'll also list that phone number down in the notes for this podcast episode, and we'll link her email address there as well. Now, let's meet Ray Schmidt, a farm kid and Iowa State University grad who started his own online meat sales and delivery company, Farm Story Meats, back in 2018. Ray was also the third place finisher in Iowa Farm Bureau's 2021 Grow Your Future Award competition for young ag entrepreneurs. Again, here's Corey with Ray Schmidt of Farm Story Meats. So starting out, can you tell us a little bit about your business? Yeah, so Farm Story Meats was founded about three years ago, but I've been generating the idea most of my life, actually. I grew up on a pig farm outside of Williamsburg, Iowa, where I saw my dad work really hard to perfect our animal's genetics, only to have him go to a local commodity market. And then likewise, at the end of supply chain, the customer would get their meat from, a, a say, like a grocery store and have no idea where it came from. So my goal was kind of bridge the gap between the two and provide the convenience of delivery or shipping to customers and using high quality local farmers to leverage that. So you grew up uh, on a farm here in Iowa then? Correct. Yep. A 10 acre pig farm east of Williamsburg. As the business grew, uh, I knew I needed more than pork and my dad only raises pigs. So we worked with other farmers to provide grass-fed beef, Angus beef, pasture-raised poultry, and heritage breed lamb. So you work with uh, farmers, and is it primarily Iowa-based farmers, or do you work with farmers across the country? Yeah, all farmers are based in Iowa. Are you able to ship product across the country? Yeah, uh, to date we've shipped to 42 states, all in the continental U.S., through uh, trial and error, I guess, with the uh, shipping methods able to provide enough dry ice or ice packs or whatever to make sure that everything gets there safe and frozen. I want to circle around to that here in a few minutes, but can you tell me a little bit, I guess, how do you identify farmers you want to work with? And I, I know quality and being able to tell the story of where the meat came from is important. So kind of how does that all work into the business model? Yeah, definitely. Like I said, I started out with pork and I grew up on the farm helping with the animals and everything. So I knew the quality is there. I knew we raised the animals humanely. So the first one was easy. And then from there, just different publications, like, for example, one of these or like the Farm Bureau magazine or newspaper helped get the word out. And then I actually had a lot of farmers contacting me to be a supplier, which was a pretty cool experience. Some of those criteria are needs to be a small family farm, independently owned, no antibiotics or added hormones, humanely raised animals. And then it usually helps, too, if there's some sort of niche market with it, whether that be a grass-fed, grass-finished, black Angus, or pasture-raised poultry, or the lamb is a heritage breed lamb. So 
kind of that extra step beyond just the, the small family farm and the, the antibiotic aspect, but also uh, maybe the specific breed or how they're raised. How many farmers are you working with currently? Currently five, pretty consistently, but um, I'm expanding to a few more in the upcoming uh, season. So when you're functioning under this model, then how does the meat get processed and shipped out? Do you handle that at your office? Does it up to the individual farmer to get the meat processed and shipped? How's that work? Yeah, so I'm booking and coordinating processing dates at the various uh, lockers and processors that I use. And then uh, reaching out to my group of farmers and, you know, when will you have cows ready? How many times a year are you, are you looking to harvest? From there, they deliver the animals to the locker on the date. They get paid on carcass weight. And then I handle all the cut instructions, picking up the meat from the locker and then uh, frozen storage as well. And then I also personally handle the shipping aspect of it as well. Once the farmer raises the animal to the highest quality possible, then you get it to the locker and then pretty much you take care of it from there. Correct. Yep. It's a pretty good situation for the farmer because they get a premium over market price and they don't have to worry about, you know, somebody bailing on that said they were going to buy a whole cow or half a cow and they don't have to worry about that whole thing. They just get it to the locker and then I take care of the rest. When the meat goes out, they're involved in the marketing material. So their family picture is on marketing material we send out. So they really get that credit that they deserve for working hard to raise high quality animals. Uh, so as you started uh, kind of promoting the business and uh, getting more clients in, what's been the reception and what's been kind of both from producers in the state as well as uh, from the public? Yeah, it's been overwhelmingly positive. The public has been really receptive. I've had hundreds of satisfied customers from all over the country, and people really appreciate knowing where their food comes from. The The slogan is because where matters, because where you get your food matters. And then even our logo has like a pig snout within a compass, kind of showing that exact location of where it comes from. So the farmer really appreciates that because they get that recognition that they deserve. And then the customer really appreciates it because as there's less and less knowledge about the ag industry, I feel like the general customer actually wants to know more and more about where their food comes from. We're kind of in a situation now where we break everything up to pre-COVID and to now times. So you started this business before the COVID outbreak really started. What was the impact of that? I, did you find that really drove demand for locally sourced meats? It, it did. It really did. I was going to business school at Iowa State. So I was studying you know, businesses like Uber and Airbnb and ones like kind of disruptors. And uh, one thing I was not aware of at the time was local farmers shipping directly to the c customer. It turns out there are a few companies like that, but I wanted to be on the cutting edge of that. With that in mind, I was designing my business model to have shipping and delivery aspects to it. And my first year of sales was 2019. And then when March of 2020 came around, I was able to hit the ground running because I already had the business model in place to allow for shipping. I already had kind of the, my trial and error period done with uh, figuring out how much dry ice to use or what kind of liners work best. I think customers have really appreciated that and it really accelerated the business when I offered local delivery in the central Iowa area. That really helped out a lot and was able to hit the ground running. Were there any uh, surprises or hiccups along the way? Uh, kind of what challenges did you have to overcome to be successful? I think when starting out a new business, cash flow is always an issue, especially since I came into the business with basically nothing. Because of the way the business model works, I do pay the, the farmer up front and I pay the processor up front, but the meat sells over time. So I wasn't able to get that initial capital. So I had to be really strategic and staggering like the harvest dates in order to have enough cash flow in order to pay the next farmer. With that being said, the farmers have been very understanding on payment terms and that sort of thing. And then, of course, the uh, the shipping was a big learning curve. I've never shipped anything perishable prior to the business. So knowing what type of liner or works the best, how much dry ice to put in without overcharging. So it's kind of a trial and error thing. There are a few recommendations you can try, but for the most part, that was kind of an experimentation, you know, shipping boxes to my parents and you know, seeing how, how did the meat show up? Was it jumbled up or whatever? 
And then also calculating like when you're shipping out dry ice, that weight's going to go off as the, the shipment's going. So estimating how much the box actually will weigh when it gets scanned or and that sort of thing. You know, I find that really interesting. Uh, can you tell us where folks can find you online if they want to learn more about your business or if they want to buy a box of meat from you? Yeah, definitely. It's farmstorymeats.com. The name is from Helping Tell a Farmer's Story. And there's uh, bundles, options, there's individual cuts. Uh, like we mentioned before, there's five different species you can pick from and it's all good. I, I eat the, the stuff every day, so I can, I can vouch for it. Thanks, Ray. Next up is another young ag entrepreneur who's carving out a niche in direct-to-consumer meat sales, and that's Lily Beringer. Beringer Family Farms has been raising beef cattle near Cascade since Lily's grandpa was running the farm back in the 1950s. Now that Lily has taken an active role in helping lead the farm, they've been getting into direct-to-consumer beef sales. And it's gone so well that Beringer Family Farms beef was recently named the first place winner of Iowa Farm Bureau's 2022 Grow Your Future Award. It's quite the story. Farm Bureau's Caitlin Lamb recently caught up with Lily to talk all about it. Lily, congrats on being our 2022 winner of the Grow Your Future Award. Through that experience, we've learned a lot about you, but you're involved in agriculture in many ways, like both on and off the farm. Can you tell us more about your background? Sure. Man, I don't know where to start. So as mentioned, my name is Lily Beringer. I'm a 26-year-old third-generation farmer outside of Cascade, Iowa. My grandpa started farming in the 1950s and then It was my dad and my uncle, and then now I'm one of 26 grandchildren that's carrying on our farm. So currently it's me, my mom, and my dad that primarily keep everything going. We do row crop, corn, hay. We have our own cow herd, spring and fall calving herd. That allows me to have calves ready at different times of the year. That will go into my beef program, which I'm sure we'll touch on. And then we also custom feed a little around 500 head of feeder cattle for a different farmer. And then outside of the farm, I also work full time for Purina Animal Nutrition as a beef nutritionist. So I stay pretty busy. (laughs) Yeah, it sounds that way. And when you talk about all these things that you're involved in, you know, the family farm, your beef business, working as a nutritionist, that's a lot. Like you said, you keep really busy. How do you find balance with all of that? It's really difficult most days. And I would say that it seems like lately it's catching up with me more. I don't know. I If I don't have something to do, if I'm not busy, I, I like don't know what to do with myself. So it's just a constant go, go, go all the time. And the nice thing with my job is it has a lot of flexibility. So if things come up like cows calving or something and I'm not done exactly at the right time, I can make my own schedule. So that part is a huge asset for sure. But really, once I kind of get in my routine of things, I just always chore before work, go to work, get home, chore some more, try to fit beef business and running my social media account and anything and everything all in between. And I would like to say that it's, you know, I kind of have it figured out, but things pop up all the time. And I just feel like I have to be willing to always have my schedule change because it feel like it changes by the minute most days. Yeah. Well, it's good that, you know, I can tell from the way that you talk about it, you have a passion for it, this energy for it. So I'm sure that helps, you know, drive you through even on those days where it's like, man, everything's kind of crashing down on me, but you have, I can just hear from your voice, you know, you have this love for it. Yeah, definitely. If I didn't have the drive for it, there's plenty of different instances. And even just recently, last night, for instance, with my award from this Grow Your Future Award, I am planning on putting a walk-in freezer. So I'm trying to get that process going. Well, I had my freezer guy come last night and I'm like, this is where I want to put it because I have the box and everything purchased. Now I just, it needs to get installed. And he came and looked at it last night and was like, I have some bad news. Um, 
the breaker box that's currently there isn't big enough to run everything. So we need to replace all that. Oh, like, no. Oh! <laughs> so, Nothing can ever run smoothly. It's one hiccup after another, but yeah, what can you do, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. At least you have, you know, step one. Right. I have everything there. Now we need to make it work. Well, install it for one and then make it all work. And obviously the whole making it work isn't going to be as easy as I thought, but. Yeah. I know around our house, like anytime my husband says, oh, this will be quick. This will be easy. I'm like, you just jinxed it. Yeah. You can't even say those words. Yeah. Nope. Those words are totally banned. Yeah. Well, and like I was just mentioning before, earlier before we started doing this, even my morning routine from chores has changed within the past few days because when it's frozen in the morning and then throughout the day it's warming up and it's a muddy disaster. Some of the things that I always usually did after work, I now do before work. So that means I have to get up earlier because instead of chores taking an hour, it takes hour and a half, two hours. <laughs> so really it changes all of the time. Now, when you talked about you being, was it one of 26 grandchildren? Yes for um to help take over your grandpa's farm how does that work among all of you my dad's from one of eight and like i mentioned before it's always been my grandpa my dad and my uncle that in that in our family have been involved with the farm to keep it going through the years um and my uncle isn't married and doesn't have any kids but Growing up, I have five in my immediate family, three brothers and a sister, um, and we always had to do stuff on the farm, but me, it was, I was always proactive about it. I was outside. My punishment growing up was having to be inside, whereas my other siblings, for whatever reason, I mean, everybody has their own interests, they, they had to be asked to go out and do what they needed to do. It wasn't just, it was like their free nature to do it. So I guess... I've always just kind of been known as grandpa's little sidekick. I always went to cattle sales with him and it's just something I took interest as in from a really young age. And thankfully through all sorts of hiccups and stuff thrown at me, here we are. <laughs> and I think was it last year I saw on your Facebook page that you bought your first piece of land in March of 2020 actually so wow it's hard to believe that it's going to be coming on two years but my grandma passed away um in January and then we had to settle the estate and everything and I basically had to buy it at a price value or it was going to be gone so ever since coming home from college I just had ideas of kind of like slowly adding to what I wanted to do, adding cows, taking on a few acres. And then it was like, well, here you are, <laughs> go all in or nothing. Yeah. And that's scary. Like signing that piece of paper, my husband and I, we bought our first piece of land. I think it was about four years ago. And like, yeah, now we're really in it, right? We have this fiscal financial responsibility and it's it can be a, a little daunting, but also exciting. Yeah, for sure. And I counted the day that I went and signed the note. And you sign your name so many times. It was over 45 times I had to sign my name to then now go how much money in debt. <laughs> so yep. I was like, I don't even know what I'm signing for anymore, but here it is. <laughs> I know even when we go in to get our operating we know what we know it was it was still a land purchase and um our banker was trying to explain everything as best as he can all the numbers and then there was a piece of paper we had to sign that basically said if he made a mistake we were okay with it <laughs> I was like that's can I get that for my job <laughs> right yeah so if I can't pay for this is that okay yeah but yeah, and you had mentioned your Facebook page, and I see you're pretty active on that, showing a lot of that kind of day in the life. So that came before your beef business, right? Yeah. So since I have been a little girl and could hardly walk, I've been outside involved on the farm and not just opening gates or doing a small, I mean, hands on right at the front, feeding cattle, hauling manure running the grain cart, like 
any type of equipment, cutting hay, baling, whatever. I was always doing it. I didn't know any different, obviously. So when I went to college and then I'd be going home on the weekends and I would be telling my friends like, oh, I did this this weekend or I went and did this. They were like, do you realize that not that many people do that, especially as a female? And I was like, what? No, I mean, this is just what I do and it's what I love. And so they were the ones, some of my college friends that encouraged me to start a page and to start sharing because they're like, you come home or come back here every weekend, super excited to tell us what you all did. So, you know, why wouldn't you just share that with other people? If it can affect one person and teach them something, that's awesome. So that's kind of how my Facebook and Instagram page got started. That was in maybe October. And then I started my beef business in January. So it was about six months or so that I really just kind of started sharing the day in, day out, advocating for agriculture, kind of trying to bust some of the myths that people get taught. And it was maybe three, four months in, then some of the people were asking, like, how could we purchase your beef? And obviously through different rules and regulations and everything, we hadn't currently had a way to do that. Obviously, we have always had our own beef in our freezer that we eat for ourselves, but it always has that label not for sale on it, you know, because we just get it custom process for us to eat. And so then it was through that and really in the process of buying the farm that all of this came full surface up front to be like, how can I make this all work for one to be able to share how awesome our beef is with people. And then two, hopefully be able to diversify our income and be able to have a different avenue come in that will help me make my land payments someday. (laughs) So yeah, it was really kind of a big snowball effect. And I like to say it kind of happened by accident, but there's no turning back now. (laughs) Yeah. And that's awesome because I'm sure as a farmer, you're well connected with other people. You probably knew other people who did a direct to consumer market and you could have just suggested them, but I love how you thought I'm being asked so many times, how can we make this work? Mm -hmm. What was, what was like the biggest hurdle in getting started? First, the hardest thing that I just didn't even realize was there's like custom locker, state inspected, and then federally inspected. Well, I had followed some different farms on Instagram that were doing the shipping thing. And so I first had to decide, one, if I was just going to sell like quarters and halves, and two, if I just wanted to stay within Iowa. And through watching what they were doing, I kind of decided from the start, if I was going to do this, I wanted to do it like the hardest way possible to take it to shipping and going outside of Iowa because that's a whole different level of rules and regulations and licensing you have to do. But my reasoning for that was I am obviously very limited on time. And so if I was going to be starting this, I don't want to, nor do I have the time to sit at farmer's markets do drop-offs, pickups, all those things to try to get my beef sold just around this area. And so for shipping, I from seeing what other people were doing that I had followed and then putting myself in that shoes, I wanted to take the shipping aspect on because it's just, depending on how much you want to do, one time a week, two times a month, that kind of thing, where you know you can do your promoting throughout that time, but it's only taken a few days a month to get it done. So that was my hardest thing because as soon as you go to a federally inspected plant and sell outside of Iowa, it's a whole new book of regulations and licensing to do. And so it took a while to get that done. It was like a two to three month process to kind of get this all rolling before I finally was like, okay, I'm going to do this. (laughs) And I really like your model because you do like individual cuts of beef Mm -hmm. because not everyone has a deep freezer so not everyone's going to be able to take that half or a quarter and it's also nice that like for me we have lots of really great farmers in our area who sell direct to consumer but I have to go to them and how am I going to find the time and man getting it delivered to my door that is convenience yeah you get this high quality product at in a convenient way yes put a few clicks on the website and it goes right to your doorstep. Right when I was starting this was, okay, I closed on my farm on March 3rd. And that Friday afterwards was when COVID hit and like the world shut down. And so 
if you're involved with agriculture at all throughout COVID and even still now, getting appointments into lockers is extremely difficult. And so I had this meat I, or the beef idea in mind and then kind of had to set it to the back burner and was like, I need to figure out how to buy this farm. So then I bought the farm and then I was like, I'm going to go back to trying to figure out this beef thing. Well, that was after right after COVID hit. So the whole quarters and half things was weighed out from the fact of all of the lockers around our area were already two to three years booked out. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not going to happen. So now what should I do? And thankfully, the locker that I work with right now, they actually had just opened like a few months prior, right before COVID had started. So they had openings and I could get in within like three months after instead of three years. And so that's where it basically made the decision. It was like, okay, this is what I'm doing. Individual cuts, federally inspected shipping, because I'm not going to do quarters and halves when you have to pay extra in order to have it at a federally inspected plant. And it's over two hours away from home. So I'm not going to be juggling all of this meat to bring it back home and do all of that for just somebody doing a quarters and halves. So well, it sounds like the stars kind of aligned then and it worked out. And what has been the response since? In your pitch off presentation, you had shipped to quite a number of states outside of Iowa. January was my one year. So we're just, God, how are we in March already? Already like a couple <laughs> months outside of that. But right at my one year, I had shipped to 38 states. And I've added a few more since then. So I think I'm at 43 states so far that I've shipped to in just over a year of business. And I would say like the first six months, you know, I still only ship two times a month. So every the second and fourth Monday of every month is when I ship. And so I usually would have like when I first started, you know, five to maybe 10 boxes max that I would ship at a time. And now like over the past few months, it's between like, 15 to 20 each time. So like the orders keep growing, which is great. And like, I get this many orders. I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to package and get all these out the door in that amount of time. And then the day comes and it happens. And you're like, oh, maybe I could do an extra five next time, you know? (laughs) So it just kind of keeps growing and it's super exciting to see, you know, maybe even where I'll be a year from now. So I had a goal of selling 10 in my first year and I sold uh, over 18, and I'm hopefully have plans. My goal is to do 40 this year. So once we get this freezer established, (laughs) that is when hopefully I can get this done because I'm limiting my ability to grow due to my lack of freezer space because before the walk-in, I only have enough freezer capacity to hold three head. Gosh, I just don't even know. There's always hiccups that always come up. So... (laughs) Well, we've talked a lot about, you know, this freezer being able to help you with uh, building your business, especially with storage and all that. And that was something that was a goal of yours and through the Grow Your Future Award program that could become a realization. And so I want to ask you, like, what was that Grow Your Future Award experience like, you know, putting yourself out there, the whole like pitching at Young Farmers Conference in front of 500 people. Maybe that's something that you're used to. Maybe it's not meeting the other people who were also involved in the contest. What was that experience? It was absolutely amazing. I'm so, so thankful for the opportunity and for obviously the outcome that it was for me. Honestly, I hadn't really been that involved with Farm Bureau like prior to all this. So if anything, it was a way for me to like realize the opportunities and things that I can take advantage of through the Farm Bureau. So that's been super cool. I actually found out about the award like a while ago when somebody had just sent me a screenshot and they're like, you should apply for this. And I was like, what? And I got looking into it and I was like, okay, cool. I'm going to do this, you know? And then all of a sudden you like, you advanced on to the voting period and then you won the voting period and you go on here and I'm just sitting here like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. How does this all happen? And then I got to the conference, which I had never had been before. And while I'm there, I'm like, why have I never been here before? Like, are you kidding me? This is so cool. So that part was just cool. Just, I guess to just see 
like-minded people for one young farmers that all have the same goal in mind and two just like different opportunities within the farm bureau that i didn't realize were there and actually while i was at the young farmer conference i did that i didn't know what it was but i'm like sure no problem i signed up for the discussion meet thing and I advanced on for that too. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> did I ever expect going into that weekend that that was going to happen either? Like, no, absolutely not. But as far as like public speaking and that kind of stuff, thankfully it really doesn't bother me. I actually enjoy public speaking. I was the FFA Creed speaker in high school and never really had a problem with any of that. And then actually my first two years of uh, college, I went to Black Hawk East in Kewanee, Illinois. And I was on the horse judging team there. So like giving sets of oral reasons and, you know, you're so well rehearsed on that. And that actually, I will say my judging career and memorizing reasons really probably helped me with my speech because I probably even right now could tell you word for word what that speech was for my Grow Your Future Award. I had that whole thing memorized. I didn't have to use any notes. I just, well, for one, when you're really passionate about something, it was easy to talk about. And I only practiced it like three or four times and it just came and clicked. And I guess, thankfully, I have that memory and I would put a lot of that back to judging and giving reasons, but that's kind of what really helped me for the award. And I'm really thankful that I was able to win the grand prize and hopefully <laughs> get my freezer set up and going soon. <laughs> Yeah, you could definitely tell, you know, between you, uh, our other contestant, Jade, who does the cut flowers, and then Melissa with her ag greeting card business, that it wasn't a stretch for you all to get up there and talk about your businesses because, like you just said, because you're passionate about it, it's something that you live and breathe. And, you know, here you get this opportunity to share with your peers more about it. Um, mm hmm and then, yeah, I love how you say, you know, you didn't know the opportunities through Farm Bureau and you just showed up and you did the discussion meet. Like, hey, what do you know? The power of just like showing up and giving this contest a try. Like, you never know what's going to happen. You might as well just put yourself out there. Yeah, exactly. Now I guess I'm going to Des Moines too. So <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah. So through this experience, through being a young farmer, starting your own business, you know, what type of advice do you have for other young farmers who might be looking at a direct-to-consumer market? Uh, I guess my number one advice would be to don't turn down any opportunities that are given to you and don't think this far-stretched dream or goal is not achievable that you don't even try to get there. You know, I look back now and I'm like, how did I ever do that? And here you are, you know? So even though it might seem like the craziest, wildest, I could never do this thing, don't ever stop yourself. Really the first step is just to make that step and to try. I would say a huge asset, I guess, that helped me get started was I took an online course through Five Mary's Farm that was called Small Business from Scratch. It was 42 chapters of like starting from the very beginning, like finding your name, creating your logo, then getting into like insurance, liability, regulations, then to marketing, yada, yada. And then there was just a specific section through that too, that was called shipping from scratch. So then there was 26 chapters that showed you from start to finish, like how to do that. If I wouldn't have taken that course, I would have absolutely no idea how I would have done that. So no matter if you want to do direct market meat or anything like that, find potentially like some sort of different online classes or some sort of teaching or education that you can do your homework first. So that's what I would make sure that if you're going to do it, it is achievable, but you kind of have to do your homework. So for instance, on like the shipping side, I've had even since the comfort, some people reach out and they're like, oh, I think I want to do this. Like, I'm just going to like try it for a little bit. And I'm honestly straight up and I'm like, you need to be all in or not because overhead cost of having your boxes and your liners and everything that you need for it is so much that you can't just kind of decide you're going to ship. You know, you got to do it or not. I encourage people, if you're going to do it, make sure you have your homework done or look at different things that you could potentially do 
to learn about it before deciding you're gonna do that. Do your homework and don't be afraid to take the first step. That's some great advice from Lily to cap our interview. If you'd like to learn more about Ray and Lily and their respective companies, Farm Story Meats and Beringer Family Farms Beef, we've included links to their websites in the notes for this episode. A big thanks to Janice, Ray, and Lily for sharing their unique meat marketing insights with us, and thanks to you, our listeners, for sticking around for all of the great information. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I hope you'll join us for our next one on April 4th. Thank you for doing the work that inspires everything we do here at the Iowa Farm Bureau, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcast episodes at iowafarmbureau.com slash podcast. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews, and we welcome you to email us your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.